For those who commute to their place of employment, the prospect of returning home at the end of a hard day's work is something that most look forward to. The daily toil to continue making ends meet is over, and the prospect of returning to the comforts of home can make even the presence of heavy traffic or uncooperative stoplights a little easier to bear. It is, however, an unpleasant fact that statistically it is during these daily commutes and other short excursions from home that trouble is most likely to strike. Despite the alarming statistics, for most of us, our voyages from point A to point B are likely to remain unremarkable. However, on September 7, 1977, for one West Virginia resident, this trip proved to be anything but unremarkable. Somewhere between work and the comforts of home, her trip took a wrong turn into a 40-year nightmare. Margaret Celeste Dodd was originally a native of Akron, Ohio. In 1972, she married Kent Dodd, the brother of her roommate at the University of Akron. Four years later, the two moved to the small community of Shady Spring, just outside of Beckley, West Virginia. By all accounts, the match was a happy one. Kent Dodd went to work for the Lee Norse Company in Beckley as a hydraulic mechanic. Margaret known to her friends as Margie, found work at the newly opened Cardinal State Bank at the Raleigh Mall. For Kent Dodd, this meant a daily round-trip commute of about 24 miles to drop Margie off and then pick her up. However, Kent and Margie didn't seem to mind a bit. Margie's parents later remembered that in her frequent calls back home to Akron, all seemed to be going well. To help ease the drive time on her husband, Margie purchased a green 1977 Chevrolet Chevette. In this vehicle, Dodd began driving herself to the Raleigh Mall each day. As Interstate 64 was not yet complete to the Beckley area, Margie made her daily trip from Shady Spring to Beckley along what was then a combined U.S. Route 19 and 21. Though traffic could be heavy at times, the trek was, and still is, a fairly uneventful one. Indeed, Margaret Dodd's daily commutes seem to have gone largely without incident until the evening of September 7, 1977. Margie never made it home that night, and she has not been seen since. While 1977 may have been a good year for Margie and Kent Dodd, the same could not be said for Beckley and the surrounding areas. In the 10 months leading up to September 7th, a series of abductions and rapes had law enforcement in the region on heightened alert. In addition to the rapes and abductions, the number of missing persons cases was also alarmingly high. 86-year-old William McGinnis vanished from Shady Spring in July, followed in August by 76-year-old Thomas Duncan and then 27-year-old Nola Dale Smith in early September. In fact, throughout the entire United States, the year 1977 was one of frequent and increasingly violent crime. Margaret Dodd arrived at work on what would prove to be a somewhat more eventful day than usual. During her afternoon shift, several bank employees reported being harassed by a group of young people. One of these youths was arrested, but police would later discount any connection between this incident and Dodd's disappearance. Around 4.30 p.m., Kent Dodd visited his wife at the bank and withdrew some money. He then spent the next few hours shopping at the Raleigh Mall before leaving for home at about 7.15 p.m. While the exact time cannot be pinpointed with 100% accuracy, it is believed that Margie Dodd left the Cardinal State Bank at approximately 8.30 p.m. The Cardinal State Bank was located here, in the Raleigh Mall parking lot. It is believed that Margie Dodd left the mall and then drove south on Route 19 and 21 towards Shady Spring. 
It was late summer, so dusk was already falling over Raleigh County. Fifteen minutes later, at approximately 8.45 p.m., screams were heard here, in Beaver, West Virginia, at what was then an Amico gas station. The details of what took place at the gas station are sketchy at best. Witness John Cole was getting ready to leave his parents' home with his wife and daughter. Cole reported that while driving his car out of the alley near the home, he saw a commotion at the nearby gas station. This seemed odd, as the station normally closed at 8 p.m. Cole told police that he saw a skinny white male leaning into the back seat of a compact car, possibly a Chevelle or a Nova. According to Cole, the man was dressed in blue jeans and a dark colored jacket. At first, Cole thought the man was just putting something into the back of the car, until he heard a woman scream. Cole drove his car back down the alley to his parents' home and called the West Virginia State Police. Troopers from the Beckley Detachment arrived within 15 minutes, but by then, the compact car and its occupants were gone. All that remained were Margie Dodd's green Chevette and a few scattered clues left behind on the pavement. State Police Sergeant H.H. Medor ascertained that the vehicle belonged to Margie Dodd and contacted her husband at their home in Shady Spring. Kent Dodd wasted no time in leaving to join the authorities in Beaver. An all-points bulletin for Margie Dodd and a small green compact car was broadcast, and Kent Dodd later joined the authorities on what would prove to be a fruitless search of the surrounding area that lasted until nearly 4 a.m., Margie Dodd and her presumed abductor seem to have vanished without a trace. Jurisdiction in the Dodd case also became an issue. Beckley Police Detective Frank Pack felt it was possible that Dodd may have been abducted at the Cardinal State Bank and then forced to drive to the Amico station in Beaver where she was then transferred into another vehicle. Because the bank was located within the Beckley city limits, a joint city-state investigation was established with Detective Pack and State Police Trooper Preston Gooden at the respective helms. If you had a car that fit the description, we probably stopped and talked to you. Tension in the area was high. The day after Dodd disappeared, Raleigh County Sheriff Robert Belcher received a call from the state police. Belcher was advised that a local CB radio operator had reported seeing a man attempting to force a woman into the back of a car along Teal Road. Authorities responded to the scene, but nothing was found. Beckley police ran a check on the license number of the vehicle reported at Teal Road. The vehicle was later located near the Beckley Police Department on Prince Street, and it was quickly determined that it had not been moved since that morning. Detective Frank Pack thought that Dodd's sudden abduction may have been connected with the increased number of rapes and disappearances in the area. However, Pack was faced with the frustrating dilemma that not all of the rapes and missing persons cases were connected either. Trooper Gooden had his own frustrations. In an effort to help sharpen the recollections of potential witnesses, the abduction was recreated several times under varying lighting conditions using a green-colored vehicle. The resulting colors ran the gambit from green to blue to mustard yellow. Hypnosis of several potential witnesses yielded little in the way of useful information. Police were only able to obtain a vague and very general description of the man thought to be Dodd's abductor. Witness John Cole's seven-year-old daughter perhaps provided the most comprehensive description when she stated that the suspect strongly resembled television personality Henry Winkler. In the following weeks, authorities interviewed over 300 potential suspects and persons of interest. Known and suspected sex offenders and violent criminals in the Beckley area were investigated. Dozens of tips were followed up, but each one turned out to be a dead end. Then, after nearly two weeks of stagnation, the investigation into Margie Dodd's disappearance took a turn from the unusual to the surreal. 
In Akron, Ohio, Dodd's parents, John and Evelyn Horan, followed the investigation with deep concern, even going so far as to consult with a psychic and then traveling to West Virginia themselves to see if they could aid the authorities. The Horans later poured out their frustrations to a reporter from the Akron Beacon Journal. On September 22, 1977, the journal ran an article in which Mrs. Horan stated she was not convinced that the West Virginia authorities were doing all they could to find her daughter. John Horan had his own concerns. They aren't keeping me informed at all. I'm her father. I don't want to be treated like the little unimportant stepchild in this. Around September 25th, three days after the critical article in the journal, the Horans received a telephone call that would send the investigation in a totally different direction. The caller told the Horans his name was Joe Bob and that he knew their daughter was being held captive by his brother, whom he called Jeter. The man calling himself Joe Bob said that it would cost them $10,000 before Jeter would let Margie go. The Horans immediately contacted the FBI. Detective Pack and Trooper Gooden also traveled to Akron to assist. Later, Joe Bob called again. This time, he stated that he had killed Jeter and brought Dodd to Akron. An exchange location and time were set up by the FBI, but no one ever showed. Days later, the Horans received another call, this time from a man calling himself Jimmy. Jimmy told the Horans he had actually seen their daughter in the back of a Volkswagen bus and wanted to help them. Jimmy claimed to know Joe Bob. According to Jimmy, Joe Bob was unstable and was wanted for murder in West Virginia. The Horans later spoke again with the man calling himself Joe Bob, and another drop was set, along with a trap. On October 11th, FBI agent James Kinney, posing as a relative of the Horns, drove to the prearranged drop location. Hidden under the back seat was another FBI agent, James Bentley, armed with a tape recorder and a gun. Kinney picked up Joe Bob at the prearranged drop location, and Joe Bob then instructed Kinney to drive a circuitous route through Akron towards Barberton near South Van Buren Avenue. The drive seemed to be going along as planned until around 10.15 p.m. when the vehicle reached the 100 block of Snyder Avenue. Here, Joe Bob apparently spotted lights behind them and became agitated. Kinney, in an attempt to calm the man down, said that it was probably workers at the nearby factories leaving after a shift change. Joe Bob became enraged and plunged his hand into his pocket. Hauntingly, Joe Bob asked Kenny if he knew what a 357 Magnum could do to his head and then offered to show him. Agent Bentley quickly emerged from his hiding place in the back of the car and drew his gun on Joe Bob. Bentley identified himself and ordered Joe Bob to drop whatever weapon he was holding. Joe Bob made a sudden movement towards Agent Bentley. Bentley did not hesitate. He fired four times, and three of the shots struck Joe Bob, two in his back and one in his left side. Angered at the turn of events, Agent Kenny shouted at Joe Bob, demanding to know where Dodd was. The man never answered. Joe Bob was later identified as 36-year-old convicted criminal James Hendry. The FBI subsequently determined that Hendry was not armed at the time and that the entire affair had been nothing more than a staged extortion attempt. Detective Pack and Trooper Gooden returned to West Virginia, and the investigation into Margaret Dodd's disappearance was sent back to square one and has remained there for nearly 40 years. Although no body has ever been found, Margaret Dodd was declared legally dead in 1984, so Kent Dodd would be eligible to collect death benefits under a life insurance policy. Margaret Celeste Dodd was last seen on September 7, 1977. She was then 27 years of age and would today be 67. She was 5 feet 6 inches tall and weighed about 140 pounds. She had brown shoulder-length hair and brown eyes. When last seen, she was wearing gray slacks and a blue sweater. 
Authorities believe that Dodd was kidnapped either at the Raleigh Mall in Beckley or at the former Amico service station along Route 3 in Beaver, West Virginia. She may have been forced into the back seat of a small compact car, possibly a green Chevelle or Nova. Her alleged abductor was described as being a tall, slender white male dressed in blue jeans and a dark jacket. Authorities believe that because Dodd pulled her car off the main road and into the service station, she either knew the identity of the person in the other car or perhaps had been tricked into believing she was being pulled over by a police officer. This latter theory is bolstered by the fact that Dodd took both her purse and her keys with her when she exited the vehicle. Just why Dodd pulled her car off the road and into the service station is just one of many unanswered questions. Police have precious little evidence to go on in this case, and there have been very few new developments since 1977. Over the years, many unidentified remains have been found in the area, but none of them have been conclusively linked to Dodd. No suspect or suspects have ever been formally named, and the vague description of the suspect given by the few known witnesses was too vague to justify the issuing of a wanted poster or even a composite sketch. As of 2017, the case surrounding the disappearance of Margaret Dodd has been turned over to the Raleigh County Sheriff's Department, where it is currently being handled as a cold case. The Sheriff's Department and Crime Stoppers of West Virginia remain hopeful that someone will come forward with information concerning the disappearance of Margaret Dodd that will finally enable them to close the books on a case that has spanned nearly four decades. If you have any information concerning the disappearance of Margaret Dodd, please contact Sheriff Scott Van Meter with the Raleigh County Sheriff's Department at 304-256-1720 or Crime Stoppers of West Virginia via their website www.crimestopperswv.com or by telephone at 304-255-STOP. That's 304-255-7867.